Welcome to the first video for chapter four. We're going to be discussing the carbohydrates. It's going to include a discussion on sugar, starch, glycogen, and fiber. The learning objectives for this video, we are going to start by identifying food sources of carbohydrate. Then we're going to learn the various classifications of carbohydrates, such as simple, complex, starch, fiber, and so on. We will discuss the metabolism of carbohydrate, so how they're digested, absorbed, and how blood glucose is regulated. And then we will highlight topics relevant to carbohydrates, including recommendations for intake, and then briefly looking at ketogenic diets. So we'll start by just thinking a little bit about food sources of carbohydrate. So carbohydrate is just a fancy word for sugar and anything that breaks down to sugar in our digestive tract becomes sugar in our body is going to be a carbohydrate. So this includes fruits, not just the high carb fruits that are listed here, but any fruit. It's going to include starchy vegetables, things like corn, peas, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, Beans and legumes, so any kind of bean or lentil. Our grains, things like our breads, our pastas, our rices, oats. Anything that is made from sugar, our table sugar, our candy, our cakes, cookies, ice cream. And then finally, we find carbohydrates in many of our different sausage and beverages. So this is not a perfect picture of all the carbohydrate sources, but I thought it was a good way for those of you who are not too familiar with carbohydrates just to get started, to get an idea of where we are finding these foods. So that will serve as the basis for everything we learn in this video. So we have certain classifications of carbohydrates. And the three ones here are monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are a group of single sugar units. And for those, we have glucose, fructose, and galactose. You'll see that glucose is underlined with a star. And that is because glucose is the most important monosaccharide or most important carbohydrate in the human body. So all carbohydrates that are absorbed are going to eventually become glucose. And this is basically the currency of many of our energy systems in the body. So we use glucose to produce energy. Then we have disaccharides, and these are pairs of single sugars linked together. And for those, we have sucrose, maltose, and lactose. And each of those are composed of different combinations of the monosaccharides. We'll see that on our next slide. Finally, we have the polysaccharides. These are compounds composed of long strains of glucose units. For those, we have starch, glycogen, and fiber. So this is monosaccharides and disaccharides. We see we have fructose, glucose, and galactose. Then we have combinations of pairs of those that create sucrose, maltose, and lactose. So on the left, sucrose is table sugar, and that includes one molecule of fructose and one molecule of glucose. On the right, we have lactose, which some of you may be familiar with. This is our milk sugar, and this contains one molecule of glucose and one molecule of galactose. Maltose is a disaccharide, but it's not um, one that gets as much attention as the other two. Now we have our polysaccharides, and we said that polysaccharides were long strains uh, or long strands of glucose molecules. So on our left is our starch, and this is what most of our, or many of our complex carbohydrates, things like bread, pasta, 
rice are composed of. Then we have glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in humans and animals. So our body likes to hold on to any extra glucose that we can, and we store it in our liver and muscle as glycogen. Then on the right, we have cellulose or fiber, and this is a component of plant foods that is not broken down by the human body, but plays many important roles. We're going to have it's a separate video after this one on fiber. I thought this would be useful for you guys to just get an understanding of how the carbohydrates are classified. So they are all carbohydrates, uh, but we classify them as simple and complex. It has nothing to do with their importance or whether they are good or bad and has everything to do with their molecular structure. So our simple carbohydrates are our monosaccharides and our disaccharides, and we saw what those look like before. And then our complex carbohydrates are polysaccharides, our starches, our fibers, and glycogen. Things to know so far, glucose is the most important monosaccharide, and all carbohydrate that is absorbed into the bloodstream is eventually going to become glucose. And then we're going to use that glucose to produce energy. Lactose is also known as milk sugar. And this is the one that many people are unable to break down with this condition or a state of lactose intolerance. Polysaccharides, these are the strings of glucose molecules. Starch is the one we find in food and it is broken down during digestion. Glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrate in humans and animals, and we store it in our muscles and liver. And then fiber, carbohydrate that is not broken down and absorbed, but plays many important roles that we're gonna see in the next video. Now, why is glucose so important? I've mentioned this already, but glucose is the preferred energy source for cells in the human body, particularly the brain and red blood cells and skeletal muscle, which relies on glucose during moderate to vigorous intensity exercise. The body will work very hard to make sure that glucose is available. So any extra glucose that we have laying around, our body is going to package as glycogen and then in times of need, when the need is pretty significant, our body is able to convert protein in the form of amino acids to glucose. So protein is very, very essential to our life and to our body. But this just shows how important glucose is, is that if we need glucose, our body is willing to break down the protein in order to survive. That will bring us into our carbohydrate metabolism. Now metabolism, we're going to start with digestion. And here the goal is to break down starch and disaccharides into the monosaccharides. So monosaccharides themselves do not need to be broken down. They are absorbed intact. The fiber passes through the body and undigested, undigested and absorbed, unabsorbed, undigested and unabsorbed. Starch is going to be digested first in the mouth through an enzyme called salivary amylase. And so our salivary glands produce this enzyme. And so as we're chewing starches, we're not going to know it, but our uh, enzymes are already working to break down the starch into shorter glucose strands. Once starch reaches the stomach, it's going to stop. So there is very minimal or no carbohydrate digestion in the stomach. And then it's going to pick it up back uh, once it enters the small intestine. So the enzymes 
things that are breaking down the longer strands into shorter strands will be secreted from the pancreas and they're also found in the intestinal wall. And here, these are working to break down the sugars into shorter molecules so they can be absorbed. Disaccharide digestion does not occur in the mouth or the stomach, and that one will begin in the small intestine when those enzymes from the pancreas and intestinal wall have an opportunity to get after them. For absorption, the monosaccharides are absorbed intact in the small intestine. They are going to enter the portal vein and travel in the blood to the liver. So this is going to happen for glucose. It will also happen for galactose and fructose as well. Once galactose and fructose make it to the liver, the liver is going to convert them to glucose and then the glucose is going to leave the liver and travel to tissues throughout the body via the circulatory system. So at this point, we've already tr uh, transformed our monosaccharides into glucose, which is the currency of the cells. Now we can do this one more time. Thank you to our textbook. We have our lovely rollerblader woman so we have, starting on the top right with our bowl of cereal, all of this food here is going to be a source of carbohydrates. So we have our carbohydrate-rich cereal, we have our strawberries, and in it we have our milk, all carbohydrate-containing. So obviously we eat the cereal. Some of the starch is going to be partially broken down by the enzymes from the salivary glands. We're going to swallow it. It's going to end up in our stomach. And here, the stomach is not going to do much in terms of breaking down our carbohydrate. After it spends some time in the stomach, it's going to be passed into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, we're going to have secretion from the pancreas of enzymes. And we're also going to have enzymes in the wall of the small intestine. So... We have these molecules that have already broken down a little bit. Once they get into the small intestine and they have the action from the enzymes, then they're going to be start broken down into these single uh, sugar molecules and also the two disaccharides. These are then absorbed into the bloodstream and they are going to be sent directly to the liver. And once they're in the liver, they're going to be transformed into glucose if they're not glucose already. The final component of this is that we have our fiber and something called resistance starch, basically functions the same way, is that we are not having any breakdown in the small intestine, and they are going to pass through into the large intestine unchanged. Now, carbohydrate, or glucose rather, is something our body wants to make sure we have enough of, and it also likes to make sure that we have some storage available. And so when our available glucose exceeds the needs, it's going to be stored as glycogen, and we can store approximately 2,000 calories in our liver and skeletal muscle as glycogen. So as we need that energy, our liver is able to break down the glycogen into glucose and release it into the bloodstream as we need it. Unfortunately, we are not able to tap into our skeletal muscle in order to increase the glucose in the blood. That skeletal muscle glycogen is going to be reserved for the skeletal muscle only and used for exercise. Blood glucose level is tightly regulated by the hormones insulin and glucagon, which we saw in our chapter three video. So when blood sugar goes up, insulin brings it down. And when blood sugar goes down, 
glucagon brings it up. For more information on that, go back to your chapter three, where we go uh, into a little bit more detail when talking about the hormonal system. But we do see it again in this chapter since it is very relevant, uh, relevant to carbohydrates. So I did pull this picture in from the textbook and this just gives a little bit more uh, detail and a nice image for you to remember. The basic gist is that our blood has a desired uh, glucose range that it wants to be in and the hormonal system is going to work in order to keep that blood glucose level in that range. So when it goes up, we're going to have mechanisms to bring it down. And when it goes down, we're going to have mechanisms to bring it back up. Now, this is something many general population people are aware of, is that carbohydrate can be turned into fat. And I find that this is one of the primary drivers behind people having fear of carbohydrates. They think that if they eat carbohydrates, it's going to be turned into fat. So this is something that can occur, but now you're gonna learn the special conditions under which it occurs. So when carbohydrate intake exceeds storage capacity in the liver and skeletal muscle, the extra carbohydrate will be converted to fat by the liver. However, this does not mean it is automatically stored as fat on the body. The storage as fat only occurs when total calories exceed the body's needs. So in other words, we have a number of calories that our body needs each day in order to maintain our weight. The only way that we're gonna get storage as fat is if we're consuming too many total calories. So it's not necessarily the carbohydrates that cause increased fat deposition on our body. This is an issue of having more calories than our body needs. So in order for carbohydrates to be turned into fat, two conditions must be made, right? There must be excessive carbohydrate intake in order for those carbohydrates to be turned into fat. And then there also must be that excessive calorie intake. And once these two are met, then we're gonna have the storage of body fat. Now, this is not just true for carbohydrates, right? If we consume too much fat and too many calories, it's going to be storage of body fat. If we consume too much protein and too many calories, we're gonna have storage of body fat. So it's not the carbohydrates necessarily that are problematic in terms of fat storage. This brings us into our recommendations for carbohydrate intake. Now I've left you with three recommendations on this slide, and then we're gonna go into each of them in the upcoming slides. The first recommendation is for you to focus on fiber rich whole food sources. Number two, reduce refined white grains and added sugars. And three, you wanna strive for the acceptable macronutrient distribution range, AMDR, which is 45 to 65% of total calories. So for number one, focus on fiber rich whole food sources. Now whole food, if you remember from one of our early lectures, is foods that are closest to the natural source. So minimally processed. The dietary guideline states that at least 50% of whole grains should be whole grains. So this would be your whole food source. This means that the grain contains all three parts of the grain. It has the germ, which is the nutrient dense inner portion. It has the endosperm, which is the starchy portion. And it has the bran, which is the protective fibrous coating. A refined white grain 
removes the germ and the brand. So when this occurs, you are reducing the amount of fiber the food contains, and you are also reducing the amount and diversity of vitamins and minerals. And number two, reducing refined white grains and added sugars. From a nutritional standpoint, refined grains are inferior to the whole grains, so they are not providing an equal amount of fiber, vitamins, and minerals, and they generally do not promote the same level of fullness. So you don't stay full and satisfied for as long. The added sugars are problematic because they're considered empty calories, meaning they're providing significant amount of energy, but they are not providing a sufficient quantity or diversity of other beneficial nutrients. So this tends to be a major source of excess calories in the diets of Americans. And we find this through beverages, things like fruit juice, soda added to coffee, and then also many of our sauces and seasonings are going to have sugar. Number three was the recommendation for our acceptable macronutrient distribution range of 45 to 65% of total calories. That we can relate to this to our um, my plate. And here we have the three different examples of where we can get carbohydrates into our diet. So our grains are going to be starchy and they're going to provide a significant amount of our carbohydrate intake. This includes things like brown rice, wild rice, whole wheat pasta, whole wheat bread, quinoa, barley, and farro. Those are all whole grains. We have our fruits, which are also going to provide a significant amount of carbohydrates. We have our berries, apples, orange, banana, cherries, grapes, and peaches. And then there are some vegetables that are considered starchy vegetables and provide significant amount of carbohydrates. This include beans, all varieties, lentils, and potatoes, all varieties. So these are three different ways that carbohydrates are consuming to our percentage of total calories. And the items listed here are just some healthful examples that I included. This is not a comprehensive list. And so there are other fruits, vegetables, and grains that are going to contribute to carbohydrate intake. One thing that I want you guys to be aware of is the enrichment of refined grains. So you may see the word enriched flour, or you may hear that something is enriched. This is the process in which vitamins and minerals are added back into a food. So as we move away, as we go from whole wheat flour or whole wheat to the white refined flour or, or white grain. Um, this is a processing in which those fibers and the vitamin and minerals are stripped. So in order to ensure that people who are consuming these things are still getting those vitamins and minerals, the government has enacted plans to um, add them back into the foods. So this has been going on for a while now. In 1942, it became uh, a regulation that iron, thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin would be added back into the food. And then in 1996, they added folate, another vitamin, uh, to the list. So uh, this ensures that people who are consuming mostly refined grains are still getting uh, many of the vitamins and, mineral, vitamins and minerals in their food supply. So with this said, enrichment is a very good process and it's important for public health, but whole grain foods are still superior to enriched grain foods. And this is because they're not able to replace 
everything that is taken away. So examples of this are vitamin B6, magnesium, zinc, the fiber, and phytochemicals. These are things that are not replaced. Phytochemicals are just unique plant compounds that have benefit to us. Things like antioxidants. This image is showing how whole grain foods level up with enriched grain foods and unenriched foods. You can see with the maroon or purple bar there that the whole grain food is superior in almost every category except for these that are added back to the process of enrichment. So things like the fiber, when you get rid of the whole grain source, you're significantly reducing the fiber content, magnesium, same thing, and also zinc. So these are important nutrients that are not added back through the processing. Another thing I want you guys to be aware of is whole grains and how to identify them. So if you're looking at a food label, you can always look for whole wheat flour as the first ingredient. This is for products such as bread, crackers, and pasta. You don't want to rely on the label, the, uh, the front label, because it can be misleading. So the bread, cracker, or pasta can say high fiber, multigrain, or have a brown color, but it may not necessarily be whole grain or have very little whole grains. You should also be wary about advertisements for whole grains because junk foods are being made with whole grains now. So some examples of foods that are now whole grains are frosted flakes and fruit loops. And so these have whole grains sprinkled in but then you dump a bunch of sugar on top. So I find it interesting that these cereals are able to advertise as heart healthy, having whole grains on the front. Uh, meanwhile, they have sugar dumped into them. The final thing we're gonna move into is the ketogenic diet. This is not covered comprehensively in our textbook, but it is such a pervasive topic in today's society that I figured it was important to touch upon. A ketogenic diet is one that involves an extreme carbohydrate restriction. Sorry, there's a word missing here. This should say restriction. And for a ketogenic diet, the typical intake is less than 50 grams per day and this must be done continuously. Just for a reference, one slice of bread has about 50 grams of carbohydrates and one medium apple has about 25 grams of carbohydrates. So let's say you had a turkey sandwich and a medium apple for lunch, you've already exceeded your need for carbohydrates for the day. When you restrict the carbohydrates, it's gonna force your body into a state of ketosis. And essentially what this does is it's switching the major body fuel from glucose to something called ketones. And these ketones are made from fat. So we're able to increase the production of ketones and make this our primary fuel source by minimally taking in carbohydrates and keeping this consistently, maintaining that minimal intake, and then eating plenty of fat and keeping a moderate amount of protein in our diet. So we're kind of flipping AMDR up on its head, whereas we are recommending 45 to 65% carbohydrates in a ketogenic diet, our leading macronutrient is gonna be fat at about 60 to 80% of calories from fat. Now this is a diet that has a background in clinical use. So it was traditionally used as therapy for children with epilepsy. This is a condition of seizures. And when a child has um, retractable epilepsy, one that is not controlled 
with medications. Ketogenic diet can be used to help control seizures. But now it is commonplace for just general population adults to be doing the ketogenic diet. And it is marketed as ideal for weight loss, diabetes control, and also for endurance exercise. Most of the research on these topics show that a ketogenic diet can perform as well, but not necessarily better than traditional approaches that include carbohydrates. Now, I, I don't know what happened here, but I messed up another word. So this should say not necessarily better. That's two mistakes in a row. One of the issues with this research is that the long-term effects are still unclear. So while it generally appears safe to do a ketogenic diet in the short term with proper execution and monitoring, it is still unclear what is going to happen to individuals who are doing it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road. Now takeaways for a ketogenic diet are very, very low carbohydrate diet. I think it's important for people to understand that using fat for fuel does not equal fat loss. Total calories remain the primary driver. So as we saw with carbohydrates being turned into fat, if you are on a ketogenic diet, but you are still consuming more calories than your body needs, you're going to be storing fat. And so fat loss is going to occur when you're able to achieve that energy deficit or consuming less calories than your body needs. And then number two, a ketogenic diet requires the highest level of discipline. So many of the foods that we consume in our diet, most of our very tasteful foods here in America are high carbohydrate foods. Poor adherence to the ketogenic diet can be harmful especially if you're not quite in that state of ketosis, but you're somewhere in the middle ground where you're consuming some carbohydrates, but you're also consuming high amounts of fat. A ketogenic diet may not align with somebody's individual food preferences. So if you're not a big meat eater, you don't enjoy foods that are high in fat, it's not going to be very sustainable for you to be trying to change the foods that you enjoy. Um, and having to do it for a long period of time. And then lastly, a ketogenic diet can lead to social and emotional strain. So if you're going out to eat, having to spend extensive amounts of time figuring out what's in your food, how many grams of carbohydrates it has, where you can eat, um, you know, the thoughts of having to go to a party where there's going to be a lot of high carbohydrate foods around, all of these things can be straining for an individual. And I put this little cartoon in here because there's thought it was pretty funny. Uh, these sharks are reading their keto diet book, thinking about whether or not they're going to eat this person. They said, I think it'll be okay as long as we don't eat the bones. Ha ha. All right, and that is it for the first video of chapter four. So we will come back with a, another video, and that one will be focused on the health benefits of fiber. Thanks for watching, guys.